We're now going to move to our next topic, which is indirect alteration of prices and costs. So up until now, all the particular examples that I've been discussing have been the, the, the direct uh, alteration of prices and, and costs. Let me do some cleanup of my markers. Now we want the indirect alteration of prices and costs. Now, th this is a little bit confusing. Yeah, I had the word direct here. Now I'm discussing indirect, but under indirect, the first bullet point has the word direct in it. The, the reason is we're talking here about subsidies. So subsidies aren't a direct alteration of price or, and cost. So, so the word direct here doesn't modify prices or costs. It just it describes the type of subsidy. Subsidies are very common, especially in Europe, for pollution for to the, the, to purchase pollution control equipment. So, the subsidization of the purchase of pollution control equipment. So, if a firm wants to buy an instrument called a scrubber to take the sulfur out of air coming out of a smokestack before it escapes to the plants, then the firm gets some money for from the government to help it buy the scrubber. So that would be an example of a direct subsidy. All right, then the next the book discusses so-called so soft loans. So soft means at a below market rate of interest. So if the market rate of interest is 5%, you, the firm can go to the government and borrow money at let's say 2% if it's gonna use the money to buy pollution control equipment or to do other things that improve the condition of the environment. And finally, uh, fiscal and tax incentives, and I'm going to just emphasize the word tax here. The United States has a long tradition of implementing most economic regulation, not just environmental regulation, but any kind of environmental regulation, any kind of, of economic regulation via the tax system. As a result, the U.S. tax system is extremely complicated. It's almost impossible. It's almost unheard of now for people to, even individuals, to prepare a tax return without using a computer, because of how complicated the U.S. tax system is. Some of this is inevitable, because the U.S. wants to tax businesses based on their profit. They have to be able to figure out what profit the firm made, and that is not an easy thing, because of different kinds of considerations of of costs. Revenues are easy, but, but costs are hard. I mean, which costs should be deductible and so forth in order to actually calculate profit. But even the taxes that individuals, households, consumers pay in the United States, income taxes, are extremely complicated. And the reason is because when the government wants to change something about the way that the economy works, it often does so by making a change to the tax code. Either to give people a tax break if they, let's say, buy an electric car or put solar panels on their house, or to, uh, less commonly, or to increase taxes if, if people do things that are not in the public interest. Um, for example, there's a current move among Democrats in the U.S. Congress to tax corporations that don't pay workers high wages. In, in particular, the, the Democrats now would like to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but that may not be politically possible, so the the talk is of forcing corporations who, which pay less than $15 an hour to their workers to have to pay a tax, which the corporations wouldn't have to pay if they did pay their workers at least $15 an hour. And that would be a way of indirectly forcing at least these corporations, not everybody in the economy, but these corporations to pay at least $15 an hour because it would be cheaper to do that than to pay this tax. So that's an example of 
p making public policy by increasing the tax on somebody. As I said, more commonly, public policy in this realm is made by decreasing the tax if you do something that the government wants you to do, like putting solar panels on your roof or, or buying an electric car. All right, Box 11.1 .1 also mentions market creation and discusses two kinds of market creation, market support and marketable permits. Now, marketable permits, which is kind of sometimes called a cap and trade uh, system, is going to be extensively discussed in Chapter 13. So I think I'm going to leave even the definition of a marketable permit system to Chapter 13. I will mention that Box 11.6 deals with them, and you might want to re read Box 11.6 in conjunction with Chapter 13. Market support, what Box 11.1 .1 calls market intervention. Let me just give you an example. Governments sometimes want to encourage the recycling of paper. But paper at the wholesale level has a price which is highly volatile. In fact, anyone studying the prices of raw materials will see that raw materials prices are often much more volatile and the kind of prices that most consumers see when they're buying household goods. Most of us see this with the price of gasoline. We know that the price of oil is highly volatile because the price of gasoline changes a lot. But it turns out that's also true for metals like nickel and copper, and it's true for lumber and paper. So raw materials have often very volatile prices. So here's a problem with uh, trying to set up a recycling market for paper. Maybe seven years out of 10, recycled paper can be sold at a price that recoups the cost of recycling and generates a small profit. So I, I'm just pulling a number out of the thin air now, but let's just suppose that seven years out of 10, a paper recycling company can make a profit. But three years out of 10, it can't because the price of paper, the price of recycled paper becomes too low. If you didn't have any market support from the government, the fear would be that if you had three years of low paper prices in a row, all the recycling companies would go out of business. And so even though in the long run, on average, paper recycling would be profitable, in the short run, it might lead to losses and the firms might not be able to survive until the price of paper goes up again. So what governments have done is to intervene, as, it, as the slide says here, to, to intervene in the market to push the price of recycled paper up when otherwise it's low and push it down when otherwise it's high. In other words, to smooth it out. So if the price of paper is low, the government can intervene in the market and decide to, to buy recycled paper. And that increase in demand will, will raise the price. Similarly, if the, if the uh, price of recycled paper is really high, the government, having bought recycled paper when the price was low, can now sell the, the recycled paper when the price is high, thereby depressing the price of paper. So in this way, the government intervenes in the market in order to decrease the fluctuations in the price, in order to smooth the fluctuations in the price, so that the firms have a relatively more constant price, and therefore they, they come close to getting, let's say, their average profit every year, instead of having some years with very high profits and other years with negative profits. So that's an example of market support and, and market intervention. Okay, finally, I wanted to to describe this table at at the bottom, which is which is my version of table eleven point three. Eleven point three is more complicated and deals with more different types of regulatory schemes. So I just wanted to keep it simple and contrast contrast command and control on the one hand with economic incentive instruments on the other. 
Now, remember, so this chapter is about economic incentive instruments. The command and control were the the kind of prohibitions, like if your car emits more than a certain amount of pollution, then it's it can't be re-registered. So less than that critical amount is fine. More than that critical amount is illegal. That's command and control. On the characteristic of efficiency, Chapter 12 will prove that command and control is low in efficiency and economic incentive instruments are high on efficiency. In fact, that this is one of the most important theoretical results of all of environmental economics. The Chapter 12, Chapter 12's result of exactly this, that economic incentive instruments, in particular pollution taxes, uh, have a higher efficiency than command and control. So along this characteristic or trait, the advantage goes to economic incentive instruments. When we move to the next row, which is equity, command and control is very equitable because everybody gets treated the same way. Bill Gates's automobile is subject to exactly the same restrictions that my automobile is. And if his automobile can't pass the, the smog test, then it can't be it can't be re-registered until it's fixed. Economic incentive instruments, on the other hand, are low in equity. Economic incentive instruments can often be I don't I shouldn't say ignored, but don't affect the behavior of rich people. Uh, think about the, the direct alteration that's assessed on consumers, like product charges or deposit refund systems. If you're a particularly rich people, r rich person, you might not care about these things because the, the amount of money that you save by doing good things for the environment is so small as to be irrelevant to you. So economic, uh, basically, when you use economic incentive instruments, rich people are going to have an advantage. And so in terms of equity, command and control is better than economic incentive instruments in most people's eyes. And this is the also reason why politically often economic incentive instruments lose to command and control. That command and control is more politically popular because it's because it's more equitable. I was going to say it's perceived as being more equitable, but it actually is more equitable. So it's not just a perception, it's also the reality. The next characteristic or trait I wanted to discuss is familiarity. Command and control is very old, and lots of people are familiar with this. Economic incentive, incentive instruments are not familiar to people, unless they're taking economics classes, and almost nobody has taken college economics classes. And so in terms of familiarity, it's command and control that that has the advantage. And finally, simplicity. Now, simplicity. Now, I want to argue that this is controversial. What your book says is that command and control is very simple. It scores high on simplicity because it just says below this particular amount of pollution, you're fine, and above it, you're illegal. End of story. And the book argues that economic incentive instruments are low in simplicity because you have to take a measurement of an amount of pollution, and then you have to look up a tax table, and then you have to figure out taxes, and then you have to collect the taxes, and then you have to keep records so you know that the person has paid taxes, and that the taxes haven't been diverted from the government, but they've gone to the right place. So that's the book's argument for why command and control is a lot simpler than economic incentive instruments. I'm not so sure, however, Think about command and control in terms of tailpipe emissions of automobiles. Well, if you didn't use command and control, which is this one number, and if it's below it, you're fine, and if it's above it, you can't, you have to get your engine fixed, you can't be registered there. But the thing is, an economic incentive instrument is going to be requiring you to use the same kind of meter you use for command and control. Except in command and control, you just want to know whether the meter is above or below a certain number, whereas with the economic incentive instrument, you actually have to, to read the number on the meter. But reading the number on the meter is not hard since you're using the meter anyway. And is it, it once you have the number, it's no harder to calculate 
a fee, a pollution tax, based on the amount of pollution than it is to calculate sales tax based on the amount of food that you've purchased. And every grocery store collects sales tax without really any kind of problem. So I'm not sure, I'm, I'm unconvinced by the book's argument that command and control is high in simplicity and economic incentive instruments are low in simplicity. My point is that you have to measure pollution either way. Now, it is true that economic incentive, incentive instruments do mean that money has to flow. And in command and control, it doesn't. It's not supposed to. Right? You're not supposed to bribe the person who's measuring your automobile. So economic incentive instruments, I suppose, are more complicated in that way, that they do involve assessing taxes, or fines and then collecting them. So I will admit that along those lines, economic incentive instruments are low in simplicity because they do require flows of money and flows of money require accountants and people to keep track of things. All right, so that completes chapter 11. And what we're going to do next is move to chapter 12 with pollution taxes.